just w welcome you because I have not been uh, speaking today since this morning. And I just want to say while sitting next to uh, Andreas that I have had a lovely day. So I thank you all for co-hosting as the spirit of today and talking about what you said. I thank you all for co-hosting us and each other because I think the, there is um, something very important going on here besides the echo. Echo. So there is something very important going on here and it's the decentralization of hospitality. Right? So this means that there is not a center and we all know it's not completely true because there is an organizational system behind this but still today and I would argue the, the, the duration of this project has in its spirit the ambition to decentralize hospitality because that is what the green light is in fact also about. So the reason why I proposed you, Andreas, to come here is because as a source of inspiration for me as an artist, your work has been to show that uh, systems can change. Systems which are normally patriarchic systems, hierarchical systems, uh, top-down systems, institutional systems, political systems, um, exclusive systems, but also systems which claim to be inclusive, which are in fact exclusive, and systems that claims to be something we can identify with and which we are struggling to identify with. Let me come with one example because we, we, we have only barely spoken about that. One system which we like is called EU, but we have no whatsoever emotional understanding on what on earth is EU. Another system is UN. We kind of love UN, but we have no emotional narrative to understand what is UN, right? So we all think it's important, but we feel disconnected. Not totally disconnected, but uh, do you understand what I mean? There is a kind of theoretically we say yes, but emotionally, I don't, I don't understand how to identify. So I'm very interested in this, you know, when do we feel connected and when do we feel disconnected, even though we know, we know theoretically. And for me, and I will stop my introduction in a nanosecond, for me, the refugee crisis seemed to sort of introduce the same challenge we know everything about, theoretically speaking, about the refugee crisis. Not true, but you know, we, we know so much from the media, you know, from each other, we talk about it. But the emotional narrative, it's very difficult to translate the knowledge into you know, physical relationships. It's so difficult, you know, it's so abstract. Oh, me, you know, I know what I think about the crisis, you know, refugees, EU, UN, no, you name it, right, the climate, I know what I think about it, but it's so difficult for me as a civic participant to do. And my end of the brief, the nano intro is, I cannot feel the we, we, I mean us, right, we, this means I am also a populist. Because populist means anti-V, anti-we, right? So I struggle because I realize I have become numb. And I, I don't have any we. That's why I call Andreas and I say, Andreas, help me. Sorry, help me, yes. Yes, I'll help, try. Help, help, SOS. Well, first, First, I'll say a lot of thanks. It's been a really, really interesting afternoon. And it's, it's wonderful here that things are getting a bit darker in here. And the green light moves from being just a metaphor into being kind of an atmosphere or of environment that, that we are stepped in the middle of. 
And there is something kind of really interesting about the color green. Could you think, does it make sense to speak of an evil green? Well, green can be naive. Green might be, green might be envious as well. But there is something about growth that seems to go with the green as an opening. Uh, Atif said something really interesting before. He said that Western cultural history is largely built in exile by refugees, right? And the argument is more or less that what you get out of that is that modules are being brought together, are being reconfigured. And out of that reconfiguration, what we know as Western culture has to a large degree arisen. And I was wondering whether this might be you know, one of the metaphors that the, the green light as a construction is also exploring. Not so much the feeling of weeness of becoming one, but that feeling of actually taking modules that once they get combined with each other, they actually create something that transcends beyond each an individual of these modules that comes together. So it seems to me that that kind of motif, you can say, of the greenness, of the modules that all look the same but somehow become recombined into something else, is what at least this afternoon has been about for me. And maybe that's better than being sucked into a week that dissolves each of us. Well, the green, the green for me was about uh, green go, red stop, uh, no go. So, uh, you know, cross, the threshold is green, and uh, stop is red. So it's like traffic. And what the migration and the refugee and the, you know, movement of people is, of course, about is about traffic somehow. Yes. So green in this case, it was um, maybe naive, but the, the idea would then to suggest that the green is actually hosted in a space. The space seems to have a, a shape. It has a softer outside and a, no, harder outside, softer inside, but the harder outside can be used. So if you buy a lot, right, not just one, if you buy a lot, you can actually make this. <laughs> and I can tell you, it will then be worth more what you paid for each unit together. I'm just kidding. But do you see the principle is that some people feel like this, but some people also feel like this. And I like this idea of the green light, you know, not just being a symbol, but also a unit of something you could build with. And then, of course, the green was also to suggest, uh, well, the, the, the idea of the open door. And I think, yeah, okay, I can say something about that, but, but, but why don't you say something? So green means go, but not as in go away, but as in go ahead, right? I think this is probably a very important yeah, and beautiful go, metaphor. Go on. Go yeah, on. Go on. Yeah. So, um, but, but going, going back to the we, going back to this notion of, of these large institutions that we feel ourselves to be not part of, it's a really critical thing to open up, right? How do you get that idea of belonging to something that other people belong to as well? Inside of cognitive science, inside of anthropology, people are getting very interested in exploring this notion of a we mode. Is there something about feeling that you know, we belong to a space together from where we act. And it looks really nice on paper, but in practice it comes to become kind of a, almost like a theoretical construction. I think the way that you can actually construct a we mode might precisely be through an invitation to sharing. What characterizes a we mode is instances of sharing. It might be instances of sharing acts together, of sharing language together, of sharing food together. So if there is something that creates a feeling of weakness, it might precisely be these moments where it is possible to share something with others. Because it is a sharing, I think, that transforms an I and I and a you into some kind of a we together. I like it. So hold on to these words like I do, we mode, right? So if you're going to go home and write a, a note, that's a good word to remember. We know, we mode. I, I would remember that. And then also the other word, we-ness. I don't mean to sort of deconstruct what you just said. This is so nice. We-ness. That's a nice... Uh, it's nice to be in the cultural sector and claim, you know, 
let's occupy the word weenus before some commercial company takes it and exploits it, right? So let's just sit for a second in the weenus together. So I'm so excited about this idea of that interdependence is something you co-create. Because obviously you take it for granted that if you pay tax, the government will make the weenus for you. The civic interdependence, mm -hmm. the gesellschaftliche Zusammenhangskraft, mm -hmm. is that the word? So do you see how we are actually, uh, despite paying tax, left uh, in a situation where we also have to co-create our realities or our we, we mode. Um, and you talked about sharing. So what spaces would you think, Andreas, offers the opportunity for the type of sharing which is not um, you know, so I also ask you I mean what type of space allows for a kind of sharing where I don't demand that Andreas is thinking the same thoughts than me is it the Austrian parliament do you know how what do we I mean we theoretically think about democracy as being a great host for us disagreeing, but at the end we will make a law and then we live by it. Mm -hmm. So we'll sort it out. But the truth is, the, le the legal system is also being influenced by the fact that populism has made it into the parliament. And if Andreas and I disagree, we will take that battle in the media to make sure that I will make sure nobody votes for Andreas next time. You see, so the, the price is the exclusion. I'm sorry, I could have said that a little more intelligent, but that's how it is, right? But essentially, so what other spaces, if it is not democracy on which we are celebrating our you know, shared base, I think it is to some extent, but if it's not, where do we find the type of sharing which hosts the fact that we cannot agree on everything? I mean, we should not be the same. For sure. I mean, so wh which spaces are left? So maybe the best place to start is with concrete spaces. Maybe what is a critical instance here is that once spaces get concrete, once there are situations where even very transiently people can get together, this is actually the place where you can at the same time relate to each other without dissolving into the other. So my worry is that once you talk about spaces as something that exists in a very virtual kind of way, as something where you are not co-present at the same time, then there is either the possibility of floating into them or keeping a distance with them. But it seems that some of what we are doing when we are together, even very temporarily, is this we have called it at one instance that we become, so to say, hyper-followers of each other. We did at some point a very simple experiment where basically what I was producing into the world became everything that you saw, and what you produced became everything that I saw. And out of that emerged a really kind of interesting pattern. People were trying to fall into rhythms, but since you could only know what I was doing based on what I did previously, you would try to align with me, as I was in the last moment. If I was slow, you would also be slower, but I would try to be faster to align with you. And as a result of that, you know, we were never in sync with each other, but we were kind of dancing a beautiful dance of hyper-following each other's. And maybe that element of kind of concretely coupling to each other, because everyone is trying to anticipate what the other is doing, is creating precisely that dance of being, having something that emerges stably between the two of us, without any of us falling into a pattern of mimicking the other or becoming the other. So the hyper-followers in concrete spaces that might be what takes. That's a good title for a Viennese academic book, like the hyper followers of each other. Right? Yes. It's excellent. No, I'm serious. So, so let's just say uh, I could not agree. Yes. The new third man. Anybody have an urge to scream? Scream? I'm so no, I'm so excited because is that then? Uh, do you think that happens in public space? Or do you think public space is a platform on which this could happen? And of course, public space is so many different things. But let's just say a space that is not privatized. Maybe that's a better way. You know, the little bit of space left not privatized. 
Well, I mean, I guess this space that you have today here is a public space, right? This is a very kind of temporary public space, but yet a public space. And it seems that some of what goes on in here is precisely that kind of attending to attend to what other people are up to in a situation that's fraught with loneliness, with insecurity, with kind of a trying to figure out what this is all about. So if this is a part of, if this is kind of a public space, then precisely because it's also a concrete space, I think it might happen. I think there is something about that kind of concreteness of being together which allows these kind of processes to happen. So hyper followers is a kind of hospitality, a gig, gig inside, a, uh, you know, a reflected hospitality, a reflection hospitality exercise. And I like you pointing to this space because, of course, I always feel proud if cultural spaces becomes the protagonists of the we, and I could not agree more with you. And yet we should not underestimate our own failures because I have had the luck and fortune to speak with a lot of talented journalists earlier today, and there was that interesting assumption that this space is the neutral host which is containing the arriving refugees. So there was this assumption that we were standing still in Vienna, we are being Viennese, like this, Adolf Loos, and then there is the people on the move. Whereas I would like to suggest, in terms of your hyper-following or the intentions of this being hyper-following, that today I'm Viennese. So I say, we are also on the move. Our movement is a movement of populism. It's a movement of nationalism. It's a movement of different types of arrog arrogance. But it's also a movement of compassion. Right? So we are not, not moving. Do you understand? And this is interesting. And I say it also a little bit to celebrate the great Dorian Massey, who passed away two weeks ago, who would, uh, who would say, it's a meeting up of trajectories. Vienna, let's just say Europe, right? Viennese lucky to be up front there, right? But so anyway, refugees very generalizing, totally incorrect, politically in particularly. So, so it's, a, it's a coming up of different moves. The hyper-following is a sort of exchange. Because as one press person said on the phone, clearly the refugees have been traumatized. They are, you know, in various degrees, struggling with a degree of post-traumatic stress. Yes, for sure. And if we are lucky, we can host their trauma with such generosity that there is an element of de-traumatization. Maybe not, but if we're lucky. But let's not make the wrong assumption that the Viennese is not also traumatized by populism. Right? Vienna and Europe has been traumatized into the arrogance which has supported the non-compassion based activity which is the one of exclusion. So let's also celebrate the fact that sometimes the defense on the Viennese side, and again I mean Europe, the defense comes down and maybe there is also a degree of de, no, yeah, de or e, no, de-traumatization. And this is the dance. So we don't have a host. We are being hosted today by our refugee friends. Or in other words, and this is very politically wrong, we are in the same bloody boat, right? We are destiny, speaking about destiny, we are in the same challenge. It's not us hosting an act, a passive us hosting an active them, it's all of us having to become passive. And as arrogant, I'm sorry, now it's mm -hmm. getting a monologue, I'll finish it, I promise, <laughs> I'll finish it, I'll finish it. To be, continue to be politically incorrect, the, the arrogance is met with ignorance. Because despite um, you know, the, the, the complexity of the conflicts, the illusions being told at the border of these countries of what will be upon arrival is a sign of ignorance. So there is an incredibly challenging situation. It is the meeting up or it is the dance. It's the hyper following between arrogance and ignorance. And this is why 
your theories are so compelling because there is no hierarchy and it's about the we. So <clears throat> the idea of a neutral space is a really interesting one. In my experience, it takes an enormous amount of energy, effort, power to actually maintain something that looks like a neutral space. And spaces are always politicized. Spaces are also changing. Spaces are also re always reflecting the type of processes that goes on there. The experience for me today walking around Vienna, this part of Vienna, just flying in, has been really open and welcoming. My first experience in Vienna probably 20 years ago was when I was here as a young student at a conference. And, and somehow, no matter what I did in town, someone told me off. You know, as I walked the street, I walked in the wrong way. As I sat in the tramway, I sat in the wrong way. I'm usually not told off in public space. So the experience was one that, in a sense, it was a neutral space, but it was a space that could only be kept neutral by constantly enforcing norms on what was right and not was right, not right. It was not in a very kind of disdainful way. It was mainly kind of stating to the obvious wild person coming in from the north that, you know, there are certain ways that you're expected to behave or not to behave. And of course, this is also part of a social space, a kind of enforcing particular norms and rules of engagement with each other. It might even be a necessary part of social space. But the notion of a space as being just there, as being just, you can say, like a, an empty area where billiard balls are touring around and interacting only with each other, is just not what characterizes human lives. In our situation, the history of the space, the patterns of interactions that were already there, the shapings that are there, is to a huge degree also shaping what it is possible to do in the now and here. Which is why it's so important to think about spaces, to think about not creating passive spaces or neutral spaces, but spaces that allow for particular forms of interactions. Because in setting up spaces, you also set up rules of interactions, ways of engaging with each other, and also kind of hierarchies of what can be done and what cannot be done. So in that sense, I think exploring spaces is really a political, an artistic, a creative way of setting up rules of engagements for human interaction. I agree. <laughs> it's so boring that to have two people who totally agree, right? Then it's like, it's actually difficult to make a good argument. I'm very curious about the, maybe you can say something about, well, how do we, I, you know, embody I mean, physically, actually, take the position of becoming spatial agents. Mm. I think of me being an artist is a is for me. It allows me to, you know, in in the in the nature of elasticity to mm -hmm. sort of experience. You know, if I do this, then it has consequences. Mm -hmm. If I do, oh, that went wrong. You know, wrong work, of, bad work of art. You know, so so I'm um, I'm in the fortunate position of. Given, have been given the artistic toolbox of experimentation. And believe me, I make plenty of mistakes. Mm -hmm. But so the point, is, the point is, how do one embody, because frankly speaking, it's also a little bit theoretical, but in public space, how do we embody public, or you know, how do we make sure that we at least don't disembody but do, you, do you understand what I'm getting yeah. at? No, I think, I think so. The notion of what does it mean to embody, I think, is a critical one. Let's, let's just shift frame for a moment and look at artificial intelligence, right? So some 15 years ago, the notion of chess was the idea that this was the ultimate kind of test of intelligence would be Kasparov who could beat anyone in chess. And then he played against Big Blue and he lost. Uh, a couple of months ago, we saw a similar thing repeating itself with the game of Go. Now we heard that it was such a complicated thing that no computer would ever be able to realize it. And we can see when it comes to these kind of processes of figuring out particular games in the world, there is no, to me, no kind of um, doubt that we can come up with algorithms that can do that a lot better. But what, seems, what humans seem to be really good at probably better than any other system that we know is precisely to be embodied, to be acting in the world, to be realizing that it is precisely by being in the world and with others that we have access both to ourselves and to others. So probably the critical kind of starting point here is to say, yes, we are embodied. We can be outcompeted on all sorts of computational processes, etc. But what people are really, really good at is at being in the world at spotties with others. 
And the moment that you are that, the moment that you are here as a body, and also as a body with a mind, etc., it's almost impossible not to be affected by others. And it might be precisely this sense of being affected, of being touched by others, of being bodies that are interacting with each other. But I think that realization is a critical instance of what it is like to be humans in these instances. So the best way to start is to say, well, yes, embodiment is everything that counts because we are here as bodies with each other. And that's the starting point. So this actually, the, I mean, it might sound abstract, even though it's about something totally basic, such as embodiment. And the reason why I'm so excited, even though I'm very calm, is that because this is exactly the type of considerations, of course not as beautifully articulated, that I toss around in the studio throughout the day. So if you sit there and think that this is so abstract, whatever, I just say, no, it's not. It's like totally what I'm working on, right? Do you see? Do you see? So if you had a moment of drifting, just please come back here because I totally need your attention. So I'm so excited about this. And of course, the worst fear I have is being disembodied, right? Because you become like a chess playing computer. You can be really smart, but you have no consequences. So for me, for me embodiment is about, and, and I have a question, when do we know? Because I ask myself. So I go into a space, and don't you all know the experience? You stand in front of something, and this does not happen so often, fair enough. I mean, for me, not at least. You stand in front of a work of art. Maybe this amazing green light that you should buy, right? So anyway, you stand in front of a work of art, and then you say, oh, I know that feeling. Right? That, I, maybe we don't say, I identify with that. I had yet not verbalized it in a language. This funny ball is, in a way, it's a form, it's a language. It's, a, it's giving, giving language to an idea. So, it speaks, it is verbalizing on my behalf something that I emotionally was working on, but I had not yet come to the point of, of somehow articulating it it was not yet given a shape, a form, a sculptural language, a spatial, an architectural, an urban plan, a landscape. What I had in me suddenly in this moment of experience, experience exchange um, was translated into me uh, seeing myself from the outside. It's a third person perspective. So one could go on this conversation going into some kind of psychological conundrum, but do you see the point is I was reflected by a work of art. The work of art actually hosted my experience for me and I felt, now this is very including, and this is where I think embodiment among other places could happen, I felt seen by the work of art. The work of art is looking at me. I am the one being watched. I am the object and the work of art is the subject. Or we are both the subjects or we are both the objects. doesn't matter. Subject and object does not matter. Right? Triple A. Right? Uh, triple O. I'm sorry. Triple O. Yeah. Theory. Uh, uh, on, on, uh, 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 what is the triple O? Ontology, ongoing... Ah. Yeah? I, I, I'm oh. not kind of updated well, who, on the What's the latest? chap? Like Timothy Morton. Who knows the triple O? Ah, there we go. So you're object oriented ontology. Yes, anyway, right? No subject object. It's like all the students of Bruno Latour, right? All these smart ones, right? But anyway, do you see suddenly you are being hosted slash and now that's the question. could one say because I'm of course I'm looking for I'm looking for the stitching needle, where does embodiment actually if not take but then claim space, because it does take space. So, going back to Bruno Latour that was quoted before, he, he wrote a very beautiful article some years ago called on interobjectivity, inter and that was kind of pursuing the idea that if we think what characterizes humans is intersubjectivity, the idea is that we have emotions and hierarchies between us, he said, that's totally wrong. Just go and see a baboon tribe and you will see nothing but intersubjectivity. It's all about hierarchies. It's all about, so to say, social emotions that are being played out aggressively or non-aggressively. 
And Latour claimed that what really seems to characterize us as humans is this ability we have to, so to say, set objects out in the world in such a way that they become, on one hand, an extension of ourselves, and on the other hand, the space within which our lives are being unfolded and reconfigured. We are doing some really interesting work with archaeologists to look at the kind of very early hominid uh, record of object production. It, it turns out now that you know, we used to think that the Europeans invented the art in Lascaux in France 20,000, 30,000 years ago. But it seems now that a lot of the things that have been ascribed to processes in Western Europe really originated in Southern Africa probably 60 or 70,000 years earlier. Kind of a really beautiful and interesting development. But what they seem to be finding in this area and what we are exploring with these archaeologists are some kind of very interesting and tangible ways in which it seems that suddenly the way that you can put things out in the world at first maybe by coincidence, but then as markers of something seems to be what's being identified there. It's almost as at the moment where the object is out there, then what you also put out there is a sense of agency. So a sense of the other person comes out there with the object and suddenly by living in a world of objects, you actually come to live in a world of other people's agencies as well. So in very interesting ways, it seems that by going via the objects, the world becomes basically animistic because behind every object is an agency, is an intentionality. And thereby, at the same time, you both get the intentionality and the presence of the other persons and the objects. And at least it's kind of one hypothesis and one idea that people are exploring, that this ability over time to find ways of creating environments of intentionality out there is really what has created the quite extraordinary ways that people can deal with each other. So objects become, as we call them, kind of technologies of the mind, because it's in that kind of externalization that we create other ways that we can be with ourselves, that we can be with others, and that we can create things that transform the world. And so in that sense, I think the, you know, the object, the power of the object, in not just embedding intentionality, but also constraining and funneling and allowing for novel things to happen, is something that in the research world people are only starting to appreciate. And if you think about it, isn't that just what the object called the green light, which you will all buy in a second, does, right? It hosts exactly in the funneling way, funneling just like a vortex that drives you down through a black hole, almost but like, like a green hole. Uh, you know, uh, it, it hosts the effort. Before we called it agencies, we called it affordances. Mm. Wasn't mm. that right? Yeah. Uh, sort of in the artistic generalizing way, I can, I can use these theoretical terms as I please, functionalizing them on my behalf. But, so this is so interesting, and because the, 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 the point being, we work, or I in this case in particular, work within what we call the cultural sector. We have a bit, of land us, a, a bit of land around us called Europe, which is, to a great extent, considering the cultural sector like a supplement to the rational sector called what's left of modernity. The truth is Europe is turning into a museum. Retro retroactive, regressive, you know, historically uh, counterproductive, uh, well, you know, it's like Italy, right? No contemporary... A lot of contemporary people, of course, but you see the point is, why is the cultural sector being marginalized instead of seen as the vehicle or, let's say, the identity machine, the we machine, the V mode, v, the weenus generator? Uh, do you see? So why do you think that is, uh, Andreas? So why, why on earth is, because obviously cultural agency, and I'm not saying my project is successful, but I have great confidence that the cultural strategy, the book of cultural strategies actually hosts, no, uh, has more solutions to conflict, or let's call it counter-nationalistic agencies than the political sector. And the political sector is not doing very well. I mean, it's not doing so bad, okay. Right? So I'm not, I'm not trying to be being, being ignorant, but I'm just saying why do you think the cultural sector is not seen as the guiding light in Europe? Hmm, that's a good question, but 
<laughs> the guiding green light in your well, the guiding green light. Well, I think what, what it might take for the cultural sector or for any sector to achieve the things that you are asking for there is to kind of return some kind of agency to the people who are consuming it or who are taking part of it, kind of going or doing the interesting shift from being a consumer of objects to being somehow co-producer of objects or of situations, etc. It seems to me that this is really the critical challenge that we're all facing now. The moment that you can say materiality, so to say, almost it becomes produced automatically. We have no knowledge of how particular items become produced, neither as symbolic ideas that are circulating around us or in the objects that we are surrounded with. I think if there is a radical move or a radical change needed, it's kind of regaining that feeling of agency being part of the objects I'm surrounded by. And I can give you a small instance of that. So we created kind of a very tongue-in-cheek like experiment inside our research group at some point where we had groups of people build simple structures together. They were given an abstract idea, democracy, justice, etc. And then out of small things they should build a representation of this. Either they should do it on themselves or with others. And then we took them into a brain scanner and we showed them instances of these justice, democracy, etc. that they had either themselves been involved in building or that other people had been involved in building. And then we asked and did the clever tricks you can do with brain scanners and that's highly debatable what comes out of it. But the interesting finding was that when people saw objects that they themselves had been involved in making and when they were then asked about the meaning of these objects, the area of the brain that, so to say, lit up seemed to have to do with things that involves things like collectiveness, weeness, sociality, etc., and also a sense of personal memory. So it was always, almost as if by kind of producing the objects together, when confronted with the objects later, they were carrying kind of memory traces to our brain scanners of what it had been like to produce these kind of objects. So maybe this is really the challenge that we are facing now. If the weenus is kind of also about an experience of taking a responsibility for these things, then a critical element in it is that when you are confronted with it, you should realize or you should hopefully be able to see yourself in these particular projects or in these particular objects. In another kind of um, unrelated study, we were doing a similar thing. People were there putting together a strange mechanical device and they had instructions to build it and some people knew what they were building. It was a mechanical apple peeler and other people... That, that is at the university where you work. Yes, the other people did not know what they were building. Uh, they were equally good at building it. They had equally kind of a number of small elements left that they couldn't build. But we then constructed a simple experiment where people had to do a sharing game with each other. This is an investment game. It's called a public goods game among economists. And the idea is that, you know, I put something into a pool and you put something into a pool. We don't know what each other puts into the pool, but then this pool magically grows and we share whatever is in it. Now, the best for me is if you put everything into the pool, I get half of your thing and then I keep everything to myself. Of course, for you, this is a really bad strategy. And the question is, can we come up with a situation where we both trust each other to invest the maximum and then get things out of it again. And what we found in this experiment, kind of quite surprising to ourselves, was that when people knew what they were doing, they were basically investing everything into the common pool after they had built something together. Whereas if people didn't know what they were doing, they were still doing the product, you know, they were much more reluctant to kind of play that simple collective game of investing in a sharing kind of way. And very interestingly, when they had actually known what they were up to, what the result of their work was all about, they were also much more willing to trust in or invest in another person that they hadn't met previously. So that means that if they knew the narrative, the weeness was more experienced. It was almost, and it makes you, so to say, become re-invoked as a Marxist, it was almost the idea that if you don't really know the outcome of the labors that you're involved in, if you become, so to say, disembodied, if you become disfranchised from what you're going to make, this translates also into relations of how we can do things with each other. So this is, you can say, another version of the embodiment. It's the idea to say that somehow what we are doing, not just with our, op what we're doing with our objects translates into what we do with each other. And vice versa, what we do with each other translates into what we do with our objects. You know, so from that perspective, I find 
the kind of thing that you are trying out here kind of a really interesting experience and an interesting experiment. Because potentially it's exploring the idea that, so to say, by doing things together, by constructing things together, by taking a shared responsibility, some of that shared responsibility gets inherited into the objects on one hand, and on the other hand, part of the responsibility for what is out there becomes translated into what is it that we have between ourselves. And that's kind of a version of the type of concrete spaces that we talked about at first. This is really interesting, and I think we are moving into the later part or the end part of this uh, conversation. Which brings me to think that you have worked a bit on which scale or the, which size of a system gives it a more sustainable long-term life. The stability of a system is obviously uh, one could t question. You know, if this project, the green light project, if it was, you know, maybe fifty thousand participants on both sides, so a hundred thousand people. You know, just thinking, right? And be, before I say that, so maybe you can say something about the stability slash scale of of events, because clearly we are in the nano scale of the refugee crisis, right? We are touching it with a needle, you know, barely touching it with a needle, but still we're doing something. Huh? So it's maybe not already not so small, but. I also just want to into that equation, scale versus um, success. No, scale slash success. Here we have two particular agents, intentionalities. It's the one of Boris and it's one of Francisca. The component in that equation I was trying to bring, because I was very curious about your research on stability of systems, because it's also about democracy somehow, right? But anyway, so. So what is unique about the talent that Boris, the unpredictable talent that Boris and Francisca, and I mean, let's be fair, everybody brings in, and of course, Francesca, in her own modest uh, sort of me way, uh, brings underneath all of this, right? She's hosting all of this as a kind of deep uh, tone in the earth, uh, sort of humming tone. And the, so just like, if we go a little higher up, there is the day-to-day slash between creativity, art, con contemporary culture, press, you know, all that stuff. And then the social scientific challenge, the social scientific sophistication of being able to host a trauma. And, you know, to know when to look for supervision when you are facing a challenge that is a little bit beyond your, your sort of palette, right? What do you do with a person who is in fact not predictable? And how do we still say to that person, you're welcome? I don't understand exactly, but you're still welcome. See, now that takes up a little bit of talent, which I call the unpredictable talent. So I mentioned to you previously this idea of hyper followers, right? And we had that in a situation where basically, you know, I would be tapping, you would be tapping, you would be hearing my tappings, I would be hearing your tappings, and we would constantly adjust to each other. And what we saw was that you know, people are unpredictable, but if they are responsive at the same time, if they can adapt to me, then the emergent system can be very stable. We saw in these experiments also that if there is a situation where the other person is both unpredictable and not responsive, then it's really, really difficult to interact with them. So kind of a way to get around with the unpredictability is to set up ways of introducing responsiveness into a system because that allows us to become hyper followers or to fall into these patterns of mutually coordinating with each other. Now the question of scale is a really interesting one. There is a, a famous British, I guess, anthropologist called Robin Dunbar and he has this uh, interesting idea about language, that what language allowed us to do was to expand into larger groups. Again, if you look at baboons, they can host a group of about 30 or 40 people, and the idea seems to be that the way that they solve conflicts between each other is they spend a lot of time grooming each other. And there is only you know, certain individuals that you can actually find time to groom if you have to do it bodies to bodies. Donbass's idea is that with language, you can certainly expand that up to a group size of maybe three to 400. This is the group that you can keep track of and that you can groom 
in such a setting, but he has huge difficulties explaining how we can move into larger groupings again. There is a Dunbar number saying, well, you know, three to 400 might be what people can contain. But that, of course, is a very dissatisfying idea because we know now that we organize ourselves into much, much larger groupings. From looking at things like states, etc., we know quite a bit about what does it take, let's say, for a state, and Denmark is an interesting case here, you know, for a state to create the idea of something being able to coordinate inside of the borders. And it seems that a notion of homogeneity within the borders and differences to others is kind of a very effective way to set up that kind of feeling of weakness within such a situation. But as we are seeing now also very much in a Danish situation that is that that kind of model is just not a solution to the situation we are facing. So I think in a sense it's, it's really an explorative work about how do we set up ways of social organization that takes us beyond the 300 or 400, that takes us into larger collectives but without falling into the, you can see, the trap of the nationalism of the 20s and 19th century, which was that the only way that we can create these kind of stable communities is to deal with homogeneity in the inside as opposed to differences on the outside. An interesting way is it might be looking to empires rather than nation states, which is kind of the solution to these things here, because what characterizes an empire is that it cares about a center and not really about the periphery, but what goes on across the borders are not so important. So I think what's needed are novel ways to think about how do we get out of a notion of borders and create systems that are sufficiently responsive for us to feel part of it and to contribute to it, that allows us to scale up not just homogeneity, but also differences and responsiveness into larger systems. And that might be a challenge not just of contemporary states, but also as constructions as European Union or the UN or what you might have. And I don't really think that research knows the answer to these questions, but I think that as you're exploring in some of these works and in certain of the talkings here, you know, people are starting to see this as something that we should look into. Daniela just confirmed what I said before. This is a moment of Epiphany, perfect to stop, slash, epiphany, slash, stop, right? <laughs> so, no, and, I, I, and I thank you for bringing up the issue of uh, borders, heads of states, slash, empire, new models needed. Um, <clears throat> as the, the need for this to work is obviously to scale it thousandfold. I was just calculating in Germany with a thousand refugees, no, a million refugees just generalizing again, 50 people having gone through this last month here. So 50 versus a million, that brings us to 200,000, am I right? Yeah, 200,000, Francesca, two, just in Germany, 200,000 green light workshops. Uh, yeah, just in Germany. So now do you see the importance of this type of thinking, right? The, syst the scalability of the systems, because clearly it's, it's easy for me to say, that the sustainability of cultural strategies is a social more inclusive model on this scale. And I think we should leave it here. It's a lovely place to leave it. I just again want to thank, of course, Daniela for holding my hand in all of this. Um, hello. Can I just add one thing? Oh, absolutely. So just, just to add one thing, because what, what we have seen previously in history, and that's, is that you can say if, if a lot of social coordination really relies on novel forms of technology, of communicational technologies that allows us to do this, then there might be hope, at least if not for, for betterment, then for a different situation. So you can say if, if language as a technology was what allowed us to bootstrap into larger groups again, then the classical story from print capitalism is that what happened once you could get the newspaper out, once you could get the circulation of ideas going within a national space, Benedict Anderson's ideas, it was suddenly possible to coordinate empires and coordinate large countries based on this idea here. But you know, what we might be experiencing now is a radical version of the ways that we can communicate with each other that might be as transformative as print capitalism was in the first instance. And what it is characterized by is at least potentially some kind of a bi-directionality, some kind of a responsiveness, some kind of other ways of setting up networks of organization with each other that seems to rely on other structures. So I would definitely think that you know, there are 
There are new media of coordinating with each other that might be ways of exploring the type of solutions that you have been asking for. I like it, new media, because that, the one question I did not ask, and this brings us... Why don't I just celebrate this as a great closing remark, Andreas, and also thank you for, for being here, and then give you a question, because the new media slash being the answer, but also, frankly speaking, we were lucky not to debate this today, also the challenge of... We spoke about embodiment, about the hospitality of feeling reflected by, you know, by a book, if you want, by, by a work. And then we have on the other side, talking about new media, how do you embody when doing a selfie? You know, the selfie problem, right? So in my work, very often I have like 90% of the people who saw my work, they did a selfie, we were busy doing that. The 10%, they kind of... I wish they kind of looked at it and they kind of sort of had some kind of experience. But then again, I'm such an old fart, you know, old fa like other generation type of stuff. So I'm so excited that you bring in the hope and optimism. And the next discussion we will have will start right there, you know, next time we meet, to which you should all come. So why don't you go home with that question? How on earth are you going to embody and do selfies at the same time? Right? Bring a selfie stick. Yeah, okay. Cheers. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much.